In the last chapter, we talked about what goes on in the outside world as far as the economy is concerned. Taxes, government spending, inflation, unemployment, national expenditure, all of these things will potentially have an impact on an organisation. What we're going to talk about in Chapter 11 is we're going to talk about things that affect the business perhaps in a bit more detail. The thing with the economy is inflation affects everybody. Unemployment affects everybody. What we're interested in Chapter 11 is we're interested more is what affects our company. And there may be things here that are particular to us that affect our business and don't affect other businesses. Now, you will see Chapter 10 and particularly Chapter 11 again when we come and talk about Paper P3, because these both come in again and they're very important when we get to Paper P3. So the idea behind Chapter 10 and Chapter 11 is we must pay attention to what's going on in the outside world. Now, the good thing about Chapter 11 is there's really only a couple of ideas that we have in here. The first of them is what's called the business environment. And the business environment is talking about the environment is anything beyond the boundary of our organisation. That's a fancy way of saying what is going on outside our organisation which might affect it. Very, very simple. You can, do, you can look at this using what's called pest analysis. Again, it's a big thing, big thing when I see you for P3. We'll be talking about pest, or pest analysis. So pest analysis simply says, let's look at everything that's happening in the outside world and divide it into four categories. P, E, S and T, I will just tell you now, although we're going to see them again in a minute. Political, economic, social, technological. Anything at all that happens in the outside world can be divided into one of those four boxes. And the reason we are interested in it in paper F1 is simply to say something has changed. That's all we're going to do. In paper P3, we will then start saying something has changed. Is it making it harder for us to run a business or is it making it easier for us to run a business? We're not really going to worry too much about that now, but just to warn you, that's what we're going to get later on. So, political, economic, social, technological. I'm not really going to worry very much about economic, because that was chapter 10. Inflation, unemployment, tax rates, interest rates, blah, 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 blah. That's the stuff we've already seen. I'm interested in the other three for now. Political. Is there anything that's going to change as far as the law is concerned, which is going to make our lives easier or difficult? Is it going to put our costs up, put our costs down? What's going to happen? So organisations need to consider things like legislation, changes in the law. So, for example, one of the things that has happened in the European Union over the last couple of years is what's it's to do with recycling. Now, if I buy a television, so there are various products that are in this kind of category, if I buy a television, one of the things that the company I buy it from, one of the things the shop is now supposed to do is to help me dispose of my old television. Now, the idea is that if they don't do this, then all that I would do is I'd throw my television away and that means you end up with loads and loads of rubbish. So there are various products, refrigerators is another one, where if I go to a shop and buy a new refrigerator, they are supposed to help me take the old one away. Now that, of course, means that there is a cost to them. That will affect their profit margins. And unfortunately, they have no choice about it. Some companies will pass the cost on to the consumer. I recently bought a washing machine and I got the old one taken away, but I had to pay to have it taken away. But in some industries, they aren't allowed to charge you. You have to, in effect, they have to just take that cost. So legislation could put your costs up. Regulation, again, the various rules that you have to follow. We'll talk in a minute about health and safety. 
So there might be various procedures that you are forced to follow, which again will put your costs up. They might stop you from doing something in a particular way. So we need to be aware of what these things are. Obviously, we can't break the law. And saying, oh, we didn't know, unfortunately, is obviously not good enough. So the idea is we need to investigate what's going on and make sure that we don't break these rules. The trouble is we also have to think what's going to be the financial impact on us of following these rules. You can see these might impact the organisation at a number of different levels. Locally would mean our London office. There might be rules that are in force in London. Now, a local council, I don't know the equivalent wherever you are, but in the UK you get local councils that will look at things like what you are allowed to recycle and what you aren't allowed to recycle. So there are local rules. National rules would be for the UK. So there might be national policies that we have to follow. Globally would be somebody such as we've got an international, or an even better example, an MNC. If any of you have come across that, that's a multinational company. And the idea behind an MNC is it operates in a lot of different countries and therefore there are lots of different rules that they have to follow. It might be that they can work out a way that they can follow all of them by doing the same thing everywhere in the world. So they have a policy that means that if they follow the policy, they don't break any rules anywhere. On the other hand, they might have to have certain ways of doing things in one country and a different way in another country. Underneath that, one of the particular sets of rules that you are expected to know about in paper F1, health and safety regulations. Now, 100 years ago, there were virtually no health and safety regulations whatsoever, which meant that managers of a company could get workers to do things, and if the workers were injured, if the workers were killed, the managers just got on with things. The whole idea was that the workers didn't matter. If they were injured or killed, who cares as long as we make a profit? Various companies and countries and governments have decided that that is not acceptable. And so therefore, there's going to be various rules that people have to follow. Now, obviously, this is not specific what we've got in this particular page, because there'll be different rules for different industries. Let's be honest, working as an accountant is not the most dangerous of industries, so there won't be many health and safety rules. Working down a coal mine or in a gold mine or on an oil platform, I think that's a lot different. So it will depend on the kind of situation that you get in the exam. But health and safety, the sort of things we're talking about are things like the working environment, making sure that the workplace is not dangerous or is made... Some workplaces just will be dangerous. A coal mine is a dangerous place, so making sure it's no more dangerous than it has to be. Making sure you've got the right equipment. It might include testing the equipment regularly to make sure it's not faulty and it's not going to damage things. Making sure people have been trained and investigating what happens when there's a problem. Companies will be forced to do these things. Now, it will cost money. You could argue it's probably a good idea that it costs money because then people will take it seriously. It's a good thing to spend the money on, but it still costs money. So we have to think about, um, employers have to think about making sure they don't break any of these rules. Employees must also think about the safety of others. Employees must also make sure that they follow these rules. If the company says, do it like this so that you are kept safe, and an employee breaks those rules and then gets injured, well, to a certain extent, that's the employee's fault. So one of the things that the company must do is tell all the workers what they are supposed to do, what the guidelines are. It says, as well as legal things, there are other reasons why we should take health and safety issues seriously. Ethical. Ethics is something you'll come across in P1. We should look after our staff simply because it's the right thing to do. It'd be very unfair to get staff and then treat them so badly they get injured. Motivation. 
Hertzberg, where would Hertzberg put that? Well, he'd obviously put it under the hygiene factors. If you went to a workplace which wasn't safe, I don't think you'd want to work very hard. Reputation. If you get a reputation as a company that doesn't treat its workers properly, you may well lose customers. You certainly won't get any good employees wanting to work for you. There could be damages, people suing you, there'd be a financial consequence, and all of those could end up with the loss of your business. So the idea is that we need to think about what rules we have to follow. That's the absolute minimum. We might decide, what that page is talking about, is we might decide to do even more than that. So we might decide to put extra procedures in place that we don't have to, but we choose to, to make our workers even safer. So the health and safety is one issue that I'm afraid you are expected to know about. Because if you are supervising some staff, you're expected to make sure you're not breaking any health and safety. The other thing that is in the syllabus talks about data protection, data security. As accountants, we come across a lot of confidential information about other people. We will come across information about customers and where they are located. We will come across information about suppliers and where they are located. We'll come across information about workers, how much they own, um, how much they earn, where do they live. There's a lot of information that we have and we need to be careful about it that we don't tell anybody that we're not supposed to. So data protection. Data protection means we have to make sure that this information is not misused. Now, we've got the various principles. First of all, we should acquire the information lawfully. So we can't get information illegally about people. We have to have to get it for a particular reason. It shouldn't be used for anything which is incompatible. Now, let's say, for example, you apply to me for some credit. You are a company, you want to buy something off me for some credit. I will find out something about you. Now that's completely understandable. I will find out some information about you because obviously I want to know should I give you some credit or not. That's absolutely fine. The problem would be when I found out that information, do I go around telling other people you are good to give credit to or you are bad to give credit to because that's going beyond what I got that information for. So I can only use it to help me make a decision, are you going to get any credit? After that, I can't use it for anything else. It should be relevant. It should not be excessive. The trouble is, I might collect more information than I actually need to help me make a decision on whether you get any credit. And of course, the more information I get, the more I know about you. Now, does that mean that I am perhaps knowing more than I should do about you? So, for example, one of the, I, I sometimes buy things on the internet. And when I buy things on the internet, it often comes up and it says, please fill out this form so we know about you as a customer. They are basically collecting information. One of the common lines that they have there is phone number. I always leave that blank because I don't see what business it is of theirs. They need to know my name, I understand that. They need to know my address because they need to know where to send things to. They need my email address because they may need to send me a copy of you know, what I've ordered. But I don't see that they need to know my phone number, so I don't bother putting it in. I would prefer it if they didn't bother asking for it. So do you have just the right amount of information and no more? Next time, if you do buy things on the internet, look at the kind of questions you're asked and see, do you actually, is this actually helping them at all? Because if it's not helping them, then I would just leave it blank personally. But that's just me. Data should be accurate. You come to me and you say, I would like some credit. And I look up, I, I, go, I find out about you and I find out that you are being taken to court because you've not paid a bill. Let's be honest, you don't get any credit from me. Now, maybe in two weeks' time, that court case gets settled and in fact, it turned out that you were correct. So now I should update my records. Now you have got no problems with your credit. The only thing I could find wrong was the court case. The court case has gone in your favour. 
I should update my records and now I should give you some credit. So it's up to me to keep my records accurate and up to date. If things have changed, I have got to make sure my records are updated. Don't keep the data for longer than it's required. So in other words, if you've not bought anything from me for three or four years, maybe I should get rid of your records because obviously you're not buying anything. You can always apply again if you need to. And finally, we should try and make sure that the data is not lost. I might have a lot of information about my customers. Now, what happens if somebody else finds out? I suppose it depends what the product is. But imagine, for example, I had a list of customers. Remember, imagine, for example, I was a pharmaceuticals company and I had a list of individual customers who buy the tablets that I sell. That could be quite damaging to those customers if people found out. It certainly could be embarrassing to them. So it's up to me to try and make sure that I look after all that data. And in the UK, that is governed by various bits of legislation. Data security, same kind of idea. Once I have got data, once I've got information about you, it's up to me to make sure it is not physically damaged. In other words, somebody comes along and smashes up, breaks the computer that that information was stored on. Human damage. Somebody comes along and alters it. So on a computer disk somewhere is a record of my um, details. If I've bought something from a company, they have records of my data. They know where I live. What happens again if somebody comes along and steals it? Operational problems. What happens if, for example, somebody has typed the wrong name in? Somebody's typed the wrong address in? So every time I order something, it actually goes somewhere else. These are all the kind of things we need to check. We need to make sure that the data is kept correct and is not being accidentally damaged. Final one, corruption. Any of you that have ever had a problem with a computer disk where for some reason it decides to stop working, and I've had that happen a couple of times now, any of you that have ever had that happen will know how frustrating it is. You can't do anything. Data corruption is terrible because basically you can't run your business. So data protection is something that you have to do by law. Data security is something that's probably a very good idea for you to do to make sure that you don't suffer all these problems. Now, political then says here are things that you have to do to make sure that we're not breaking the law at all. Economic, we've already dealt with because we dealt with that back in chapter 10. So the next one we're interested in is social. And it's simply, all we're talking about when we're talking about social is what might affect. It's things like this will affect demand. So is there going to be a good, a big demand for our product in a particular country? It's also going to affect our workforce. Are there going to be countries where it's going to be easier for us to recruit workers because of the way that they do things? Now, when you talk about social things, examples of this would be things like, I mean, a good example is McDonald's. What happens in McDonald's as it expands around the world? Because obviously McDonald's is in most countries now. Are there going to be issues with the kind of products that it sells? Now, the reason I use this as an example is the first one you've got there, religion. McDonald's has branches in India. And some of you may realise that a slight problem is that many people in India will not eat meat. They will not eat beef, rather, on religious grounds. So McDonald's in India has a different menu. So it has lots of vegetarian food on there. So the idea is religion might mean people don't want your products. Similarly, things like language and work-life balance. McDonald's obviously tends to be busy at early mornings and late nights, so it's very unsociable hours. In a particular country, they might be willing to work unsociable hours, and in another country, they might not be. So McDonald's might want to expand into a particular country and find it almost impossible to get workers who are willing to work there. That, again, is something that McDonald's needs to bear in mind before it makes a decision as to where it's going to go. So, wealth. 
If we have got a product which is aimed at very wealthy people, then social, you need to think about how many wealthy people there are going to be in a country. Are there a very few people who are very, very rich? Or are there lots of people who are relatively rich? Well, the second one might be more appropriate for the kind of products that we sell. So social factors can have an impact on whether we want to expand into another country or not. Over the page, we've got things like life expectancy, etc., etc. So all of these can make a difference. Local tastes and trends. Do people in a particular country want something? Perhaps one of the best examples is clothes. You know, obviously, if you're a clothes manufacturer, let's imagine that you specialise in winter clothes. There's not an awful lot of point in going to the Caribbean and opening up a shop there, because obviously they're not going to be interested. On the other hand, there'll be various parts of the world where you're going to get a lot of customers. So these might well affect, these are the sort of thing that affect where you might expand your business. Are there going to be any political things that stop us from expanding into a country? Economic conditions. Is there a recession? Is there a boom? Is it going to be suitable for us to expand? Social. Are we going to get workers and are we going to get customers? Final one we've got, technological. Technological might also affect your organisation. Now, you can see here, technology can influence lots of different things. Production. In paper F2, we tend to assume that products are made by people. Well, in real life, they might be made by machinery. So there may well, we might have to think about, is there a particular part of our production where we can lose the workers and replace them with machines instead? So can the production methods change? Communication is a big one. You know, there may be industries where being able to communicate is very important. Imagine that I'm in charge of a sales team. I've got 30 salespeople who go around the country selling things to individuals. Now, 30 years ago, it would have been very difficult for me to actually tell them anything. I would probably have to wait for them to telephone me, and then I could talk to them. But now, with mobile phones, with the emails, I can probably get hold of them almost instantaneously. Now, that might make a very big difference to a particular company. Oh, it might make very little difference, I don't know. But these are the sort of things that the examiner might test. So he might talk about how has communication changed what you want to do. Imagine, as I say, you've got these salespeople. They go to a company. 30 years ago, the customer says, I want to buy these things. The salesperson says, I will phone up the office and I will find out if they are there. And then I will, get, and I will basically, I will uh, go back to the office, I will order them for you, I'll send you an invoice. It might take a week or two. Nowadays, the um, salesperson has a laptop connected to the internet. They can directly access the stock records to know if it's in stock. They can put an order through there and then. The customer can see the order has been placed. The customer can then have an invoice generated. It's all an awful lot faster. So technology can change the way that you do things. So it could well change the structure of an organisation. Now, structure is something we're going to come to later on in the, in the course. But structure basically means things like how many workers we have and what do they actually do. Downsizing is reducing the number of workers. So I have got three workers that manufacture something, I replace them with a robot. So that means that I need less workers, that's technology. Delayering means reducing the number of managers. So one of the things we'll talk about in another section is we'll talk about flat organisations. So technology allows you to do that. You don't need as many managers because all that managers basically do is it's all to do with communication. Modern communication, emails, etc., allow you to just go straight from the top and, and communicate with the person at the bottom. You don't need all the people in between. 
So technology has allowed people to get rid of lots of middle management levels. And again, we'll talk more about what that is in another section. Outsourcing, getting others to do it. So rather than us doing something, we pay somebody else to do it. So these are all things that have changed. Final bit we've got there, technology and the consumer, changing what people want, working from home, shopping and banking online. So retail organisations, banks have been changed enormously by technology. I can't remember the last time I actually went to a bank, not actually physically went inside it to pay a bill or get some cash because I don't need to. I get my cash from an ATM, so outside the bank, and I pay most of my bills online. So I don't need to go to banks. It changes the way that people deal with things. Um, obviously, distance learning, that's quite important to us because that's what you're doing now. This would not have been possible 20 years ago. So it changes the way that people do things. Now, the key thing about PEST is an organisation has to be aware what is changing. Does it affect what we are doing at the moment? Might it affect what we're doing in the future? If it's going to affect what we're doing in the future, we should plan for it now. Now, the final thing that we've got as far as the outside world is concerned is another theory by Porter. We've already talked about Porter's value chain. This one's called Porter's Five Forces. Now, PESL, or PEST rather, is all about things that affect an entire industry. If the law changes, every single accountancy training company in the UK changes in the same way because we're all affected by the same legislation. Porter's Five Forces is much more specific. Different companies will be affected in different ways. Now, again, you don't need to worry too much about this at this point. You're going to see a lot in paper P3 and in P5. But at this point, we just need to be aware of things. Porter says that there are five other threats to the organisation. And by a threat, all that he means is that something is going to come along which makes it harder for you to earn profits. It's not going to make it impossible. It's going to make it harder. First of all, new entrants. That means there are new companies who set up in your business. That is obviously a threat because they will take your customers. Now, what Porter talks about is he talks about barriers to entry. Barriers to entry are things which stop other businesses coming in. Now, for example, imagine that I wanted, again, this is in the UK, if I wanted to set up a radio station, you need a license. You need a license from the government. If you don't have a license, you can't set up a radio station in the UK. That's a barrier to entry. So even if I wanted to set one up, I couldn't do. Another common barrier to entry is money. Imagine it's going to cost an awful lot of money to start up a company in a particular industry. Well, then again, that's a barrier to entry because it keeps other people out. What Porter is interested in is, is it easy for other people to come in or is it difficult for other people to come in? So a barrier to entry is anything which makes it harder for them to come in. The harder it is, the less we worry about that. Underneath that, the bargaining power of buyers. Now, what Porter is talking about there is he's talking about your ability to raise prices. If we have got powerful buyers, powerful customers, it means that we want to put our prices up and they won't let us. Now, a powerful customer, for example, would be a big customer. Imagine that I'm a farmer, I grow apples, and every year I get my harvest of apples and I sell them all to one supermarket. Now, obviously, if I try and put my prices up, the chances are the supermarket will just say, no, we're not going to pay that. I've got a very powerful customer. So it limits what I can do. It means I'm probably not going to be able to put my sales prices up very much. So I can't increase my profits very easily. Similarly, the bargaining power of suppliers, it's your ability to resist cost increases. I am, again, a farmer, and one of the things that I do is I obviously have lots of farm equipment that runs on petrol. 
Oil companies come along and they put petrol prices up. What do I do? I have to pay them. What am I going to do? I'm not going to turn around to the oil company and say, I'm not going to pay that. Powerful suppliers will say, we are putting your, our prices up and you'll just have to pay them. Now, powerful customers and powerful suppliers then are very difficult if we get both of them. Powerful suppliers put the costs up and you can't do anything about it. Powerful customers stop you from putting your own prices up. So what kind of things make a difference? The biggest one in the exam is how large these are. If you are talking about an electricity company, it's going to be a large supplier. Therefore, the chances are they're very powerful. So look at their size. If they are very big and you're very small, basically they are powerful and you're not. Threat of substitutes. There is obviously a danger. <clears throat> there is obviously a danger that people don't buy our products. They go and buy somebody else's. Now, that is always a threat. What Porter is talking about here is how significant is it? Now, the three kinds that we tend to have, direct, indirect, and monetary. Now, the exam might ask you to give an example of these, or what he might also do is he might say, here is a substitute, what kind is it? Imagine, for example, that we manufacture butter. So we're a company that manufactures butter. A direct substitute is somebody else who manufactures butter. So I don't buy one brand, I buy a different brand. It's still butter. An indirect substitute is somebody who buys a product from a different industry, but to do the same thing. So instead of buying butter, they buy margarine. They buy olive oil. They do something else so that they don't need to buy butter at all. Now, obviously, if there are lots of indirect substitutes, that's a bigger threat to our business than if there's just lots of direct substitutes. Direct substitutes are bad. Lots of indirect substitutes is even worse because I've now got to worry about all the other butter manufacturers because I could lose sales to them. And I could also lose sales to all the margarine manufacturers. The more of these there are, the more I have to worry, the bigger the threat it is. Monetary substitutes... That's where somebody could spend money on our product or they might decide to spend it on something else. So imagine, for example, that we were talking about a manufacturer of televisions. Direct substitute, other manufacturers of televisions. So Sony, Panasonic, those are direct substitutes for each other. Monetary substitutes, I am not going to buy a television at all. I am going to buy something else. I'm going to buy a used car. So they're all the same amount of money. Or I'm going to have a nice holiday. All the same amount of money. So a television manufacturer has to worry about other television manufacturers and other people in completely different industries. They have to worry about holiday companies. The idea is I can only spend the money once. If I spend it on a holiday, I don't spend it on a television. Now, all of us have been through this. We've done monetary substitution. You have thought to yourself, I want this. And I want that, but I can't have both. I will decide which one I'm going to buy. And they're often completely different industries. The more of those you have, the bigger the threat. Now, you get a lot of monetary substitutes as you start looking at luxury products because people don't need them. They want them. With things that people need, you don't tend to have monetary substitutes. People need them. There may be a lot of direct substitutes, but people have got to buy milk. They've got to buy bread. They've got to buy butter. They've got to buy basic things. So they're not going to be monetary substitutes. It's luxury stuff. That's where the monetary substitutes come in. And the final one we've got there, rivalry. Is there a lot of rivalry within our industry? If there is, it means that all of the companies are after the same customers. It makes it hard for us to grow. Look there for barriers to exit. Barriers to entry stop a company coming in. Barriers to exit stop a company leaving. They don't really want to carry on, but it's too expensive to shut down their factory and make everybody redundant. So Porter says these five things are threats. It's a question of whether they're a big threat or not. So in the exam, the examiner will probably give you a situation and say, which one of these threats is it? 
So with all the stuff in chapter 10 and 11, the key thing is let's think about how it affects the company. How does it affect the company now? Is it going to mean that they need to save money? Is the economy getting worse? How is it going to affect them in the future? Are they going to be able to expand or not? So they are all big things, and as I say, we're going to look at them all again in paper P3.